Hello and welcome to World Insight, coming to you live from Beijing on CCTV News. I'm your host, Tian Wei. On today's program, China-U.S. strategic dialogue as China gears up to host the G20 summit and the U.S. prepares for a contentious presidential election. Officials from the world's two largest economies are meeting in Beijing to discuss their shared future. And at the just-concluded Shangri-La dialogue in Singapore, China reasserted that it would not be bullied on security issues, including the South China Sea. Can the involved countries find consensus? We begin today's program with the eighth round of the strategic and economic dialogue between China and the United States. The dialogue has both a strategic track and an economic track. Both China and the U.S. has showed the willingness to strengthen cooperation and address differences. Finding common ground. As the biggest developing country and the biggest developed country, the relationship between China and U.S. has always been in the global spotlight. The dialogue is a platform for the two sides to enhance cooperation and avoid confrontation. Thanks to our concerted efforts, our two countries, China and the U.S., have cooperated at the bilateral, regional, and global levels in a wide range of areas, registering new programs in our relations. Last September, President Xi's state visit to the U.S. resulted in dozens of new agreements and initiatives in trade and investments. Cooperation between China and the U.S. has extended to people-to-people -people exchanges and cybersecurity. The Paris Climate Change Conference outcome is another remarkable example of the Sino-U.S. dialogue. Last December, as a result of that, and you have no idea how many people came up to me and said, and I'm sure they said the same thing to Minister Xi, that if it weren't for China and the United States coming together, Paris probably couldn't have happened. This round of dialogue could lead to substantial progress for China-U.S. bilateral investment treaty talks. U.S. Treasury Secretary Jack Lew said the U.S. is waiting for China to present a service tax negative list. A Chinese economist echoed this sentiment, but also expressed his concerns. It's possible that the new U.S. president wouldn't have formed a four-member administration in the same time period next year. So this dialogue will focus on issues in the long run rather than short-term ones. The China-U.S. strategic and economic dialogue is the highest level dialogue mechanism on a range of issues. Initiated in April 2009, it is carried out annually to narrow differences and work through problem areas. As China ramps up to hold the G20 summit this fall and the U.S. prepares for a presidential election, the dialogue comes at a noteworthy time. As differences in the South China Sea continue to intensify, the future of Sino-U.S. ties will depend on the cooperation of both countries. Absolutely important the relationship we're talking about. For more on the U.S.-China strategic and economic dialogue, I'm joined here in the Beijing studio. First of all, Mr. Yuan Peng, Vice President of the China Institute of Contemporary International Relations. Mr. Yuan, welcome to our program. Meanwhile, we would like to welcome into our studio here in Beijing, Scott Kennedy, Director of the Project on the Chinese Business and Political Economy at the Center for Strategic and International Studies. Welcome. Thanks. So, First day. How about the first day? Scott, I understand you participated in some of those discussions between the two countries. How would you wrap it up for the first day? Uh, well, I did have a chance to, to participate in the innovation dialogue, which occurred on Sunday the, uh, in advance of the SNED starting the, uh, this morning. And I would say the discussions were civil, uh, finding areas of cooperation but also areas of disagreement. And many of these areas of cooperation and disagreement are the same ones that we've had for the previous dialogues. So not a whole lot of progress. Uh, so you could make it glass half full or glass half empty mm. on, you know, depending on which specific issue you look at. Mm. Mm. What about you, Mr. Yuan? Were you surprised by what uh, Mr. Kennedy just uh, mentioned, half full, half empty? Depends on what your perspective. Uh, I agree, because it's uh, very hard to uh, agree on everything. Sometimes some agree on disagree also is a good you know, outcome. Mm. Uh, most impressive thing uh, the, this morning, uh, this, today's uh, session is opening remarks by President Xi Jinping. 
and he gave several very interesting remarks, which is uh, impressive for me. For example, he said in Asia Pacific, the U.S. and China, we have we should have a mutual circle of uh, friends, other than use this friends to hedge against the other one. So we should have a win-win cooperation. And also, he mentioned that uh, we need to stick to the new model of the relations, even if uh, the American side is reluctant to repeat that. Uh, uh, logo and the concept, but from Chinese perspective, this is the only way and the right way to pursue. So, he, the variator of this uh, very good uh, doctrine and idea, he sticks to uh, this very good. Specific, which policy and which doctrine are you talking about? Uh, you mean from uh, the Chinese president? From Chinese president, I think uh, first of all, he he think to the right direction still is a long conflict and then. Uh, uh, confrontation mm. and the mutual respect that the women cooperation still the base for the future cooperation and also he mentioned that uh, we have a lot of uh, common interests to pursue and also in Asia Pacific even if we have some uh, these differences but we need to have a very good spirit to mm. uh, co Mr. cooperate. Mr. Kennedy is that <coughs> also what the American side would like to uh see how the relationship would go? Is there enough ammunition to feed that way in order to go forward in the same direction? I think ideally the Americans would like to make cooperation and win-win the dominant theme of the relationship. Mm. Of course, though, the Americans, from everything we can tell from watching this dialogue and the run-up to it over the last several months, have a lot of, of uh, concerns about China on economic and security issues. And in fact, one of the dynamics of the SNED process is uh, the, the U.S. always seems to be like the guy chasing China, the woman around the table, trying to get commitments on certain things. And, and so that leaves the U.S. in the position of, of making demands and China trying to focus more on cooperation. Uh, and so, and we've seen that again and again over the last uh, eight years of the dialogue. That certainly is a very interesting I analogy. I've never heard that before. <laughs> but, uh, but, but, but let's just be specific a little bit, whatever yes. analogy we use. Sure. First of all, South China Sea. It seems that the both sides have very different views. Sure. So with this strategic and economic dialogue now ongoing, what can the two sides do to bring themselves at least a little bit closer, or at least bring the communication channels a little bit more smoother? Mr. Sure. Kennedy, and then go to Mr. Sure, Black. sure. Mm -hmm. uh, I think this is an a, a extremely complicated issue. Mm -hmm. It's not going to be solved uh, in this dialogue or this year. Uh, but The Hague is going to come down with a decision uh, in the next uh, several weeks or months. And I think one thing that the two parties could agree that whether, regardless of what the substance is, regardless of whether we think it's legitimate, let's not use that decision to change the context entirely to become confrontational. Mm. All right. So let's be careful about whatever that decision says so that things don't get worse as a uh, result but, but of Mr. it. Mr. Kennedy, let me just clarify to our yeah. audience. I mean, you are a very <clears throat> open-minded. Yes. You used to be in the government and now you're in the academic circle. Very open-minded uh, intellectual from the U.S. But uh, would many there in the Capitol agree with you, for example, on the Capitol Hill, particularly in the Pentagon? Um, I can't speak for them, <laughs> uh, having been an academic before I worked in a, in a think tank. Yeah. Um, but I, I can say, if there could be an agreement that uh, we don't take drastic actions as a result of whatever the decision is, mm. and that we look at the substance of what's discussed as opposed to where it came from, uh, then I think you'd actually see some parts of the, uh, particularly the Obama administration, want to engage China more on this and even be open to China engaging the other claimants on a bilateral basis. All right, let's go to Mr. Yuan. Can we, from the Chinese side, be able to see, well, there are differences, but let's not just let these differences scramble the whole relationship downward, which seem to be somewhat the case, as some argue, over the past few months, if not two years? Mm, I, I think so. I think we need to find this kind what of way. What does that need in order to make sure that's not happening that way? You know, today, the, the bad thing in U.S. and China relations, the, the relations are highly overshadowed by this single hot spot that South China Sea disputes. And the, the, the day before yesterday, and the Shangri-La dialogue in Singapore, I think everybody is just focusing on this very single topic. It seems that this is the only topic of U.S.-China relations. The SNED uh, today and tomorrow will show to the uh, world that uh, 
U.S. and China re relations is very comprehensive. Mm -hmm. We both cooperate and uh, uh, compete. And South China Sea is just one of many issues of a U.S. and China relation. We have lots of uh, in common, lots of uh, cooperative you know, areas. For example, today we also see uh, uh, President Obama's uh, celebration uh, letter of this uh, opening remarks. He's, he used the very words you just mentioned. He said that we have lots of differences, but most important thing is the differences doming mm. the U.S.-China relations. It's echoed to President Xi's remarks. But that needs a mm. lot of wisdom and mm. a lot of strategies uh, from both sides to make sure it's going to happen. But having said that, though, even though the South China Sea should not be the dominant issue on the bilateral uh, list yet, it also demonstrates certain difficulties of the relationship, which is we used to a lack of strategic trust toward one mm. another. Mm. And now, are we really seeing mm. extremely different strategic mm goals, mm. particularly in certain areas mm. of the world or in certain issues, Mr. Yuan. Yes, uh, the good news in South China In other China words, is, if yeah. I just play it even more bluntly, mm. strategic conflict. Uh, I don't think we will have a strategic conflict. Mm. We will have a long-time strategic dispute. But uh, the good news is that we don't have any territorial disputes in South China Sea. This is the base for the future cooperation. Mm. And uh, secondly, both countries have lots of uh, cooperative areas in elsewhere, elsewhere in the world, in Middle East, in Africa, okay. <coughs> in Euro Asian continent. Those cooperation will offset our conflict in this region. And most importantly, I think today both sides are highly aware of that we need crisis management and crisis prevention. Okay. And the top leaders are very cool-headed in thinking about that issue, mm. I think. Mr. Kennedy? Well, um, I think as China has become uh, more economically successful, uh, more confident, uh, their sense of, China's sense of what its interests are have evolved. Certainly 10, 15 years ago, you couldn't imagine China being so clear and unambiguous about its interest in the South China Sea, that's new for the United States, all right, mm -hmm. which has been focused on other issues uh, for a long time. Mm -hmm. And so there's a mutual adaptation. And so if it's a focus on sovereignty and which in which there's no room to negotiate or discuss, that's going to make things uh, extremely difficult uh, to deal with. So if we can figure out how to deal with these practically, both the security issues and the quite thorny economic issues mm -hmm. on investment, access, cyber, uh, et cetera, then I think we can figure out how to keep these very difficult issues mm. from enveloping the rest of the relationship. Right. Over there, our footage already played uh, on the screen demonstrates how much importance China is attaching to this relationship. Chinese president is, was there at the opening ceremony without the uh, presence of uh, his uh, U.S. counterpart. Of course, President Obama was busy on his state visit to India, but that in a way almost demonstrated how much importance both sides are attaching to this relationship. Having said that though, both of you talk about common ground. Okay, let's look at what consists of this common ground. Trade is supposed to be mm -hmm. one of those mm -hmm. pillars, at least it used to be mm -hmm. supporting our relationship going forward. Is this still that way? Is this still the pillar or it has already become the challenge, Mr. Yeah. Kennedy? Uh, it's both because uh, the 600 billion that we had in trade last year mm -hmm. and the 40 some billion in investment obviously benefited both sides, but there are winners and losers. Mm -hmm. I, um, and there's some disagreements, but I think if we can agree that we compete according to the same rules of the game, then actually the competition isn't so bad. And there's new areas that we're competing in beyond trade where the rules are less clear uh, related to currency and types of investment and the role of, say, security reviews. Uh, and so since we don't have clear rules there, that makes those more likely to be politicized mm. and hurt the rest of the relationship. So because the relationship is expanding, because China is becoming more powerful, this is a much more difficult relationship to manage. Mm. Well, we have some specific numbers coming from American businesses <coughs> talking about their feelings and sentiment toward China. Take a look at this. American Chamber of Commerce uh, in China, a nonprofit organization, of course, released a 2016 business climate survey after polling nearly 500 U.S. companies in this country. Around 
Three fourths of the companies expressed the hope that the bilateral investment treaty, the BIT, in other mm -hmm. words, uh, between the two countries, could be signed before 2018. Almost 80 percent think BIT will increase the transparency and fairness of the business environment, and around three fourths expect it to help ensure a level playing field with domestic enterprises. Of course, this is at a time, Mr. Yuan, that both are having difficulties understanding some of the difficulties both governments set for one another when it comes to investment and when it comes to trade. China complained about the anti-dumping issues coming from the U.S. about the steel and the U.S. company talk about when are we going to invest equally into the Chinese market. So BIT is the word that would pop up. But how far is it from us? I mean, after all, Mr. Obama is very likely to leave the office very soon. Mm, but uh, one example is the WTO. WTO agreements, you know, generally is uh, achieved by uh, President uh, uh, Clinton and Chinese uh, counterpart. Mm. But the final signal, uh, signing, signing of, the, signing of the, the agreements is under Bush administration. So it doesn't matter if Obama leave or not. But the most important thing, how can both countries achieve the agreements. After 24th round of negotiation, I think we see some hope that we're coming to the end of the final agreements. But mm. still, in the last minute, in the last mile, you know, it's the most hardest way to go. So still, uh, this SNED, I think, uh, is uh, one good opportunity mm. to move a little bit even uh, further. But uh, uh, if it uh, can be uh, finally you know, signed, uh, uh, reach uh, agreements this time, as we need to wait and see. Mm. Well, uh, Mr. Yuan Peng is the expert uh, talking mm. about U.S.-China relations in China. Mm. He, of course, is very sophisticated enough to understand all of the complications as a result of the ongoing presidential mm. election mm. inside the United States. Certainly trade has been talked yes. about by both candidates coming from both parties. And we are seeing some very interesting phenomena when you're during mm. your primaries, of course. Uh, ha having said that, though, uh, how, well, how much impact would that have on the trade mechanism, for example, BIT? Both sides already have in mind, and yet mm -hmm. still in this very difficult final hour or mm -hmm. the last mile. Well, obviously the, the campaigns for the White House, both the Republican and Democratic side, have highlighted a lot of the concerns mm -hmm. uh, about trade investment and the effect of globalization on jobs in the United States. Uh, but I think that reflects a broader trend as opposed to simply being a new issue that's come on the agenda by surprise. I think we're on a long march to mm -hmm. getting a BIT mm -hmm. uh, between the U.S. and China. And the word I hear more and more in the United States about the economic relationship is the word reciprocity. Mm -hmm. uh, and reciprocity actually is a code word for increasing barriers mm -hmm. or only making concessions if you receive the same exactly from the other side. And I think the, 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 there's a challenge between going in both directions mm -hmm. toward more greater openness or going toward reciprocity. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But, but would that mean harsher uh, debates mm -hmm. and even uh, fights when it comes to trade, uh, Mr. Yuan. It can be, in a way, see eye to eye. If you move this way, I'm going to do exactly the same, probably put even more pressure onto your investment or trade into our country. I mean, both sides could do this. I think uh, now we are facing the new stage of the trade relations between our two countries. It's time for us to think about uh, mutual uh, investment. Mm. So BIT is a must for upgrade our trade relations in the next 20 years. But maybe it's in the wrong timing because now in the American election uh, season and both Donald Trump and Hillary Clinton, uh, because of the election phenomena, they both are very suspicious and hesitate to support the free trade relations. Right. So generally speaking and protectionism today is more popular in the States than welcoming uh, BIT. I, even uh, TPP, I'm afraid that can be finally passed okay. by the Congress under this administration. All right, that's a big question mark. Before we go, one sentence, both from, from the two of you, what do you make of it? I mean, this is already the eighth strategic and economic dialogue. Mm. This is the last year of the Obama administration. Mm. This is, can be a turning point of bilateral relations. Mm. How much hope can we pin on this? How much hope can we pin on the core capabilities sure. of these bilateral relations? Sure. Mr. Kennedy, one awesome. sentence or two. 
the strategic and economic dialogue has lost a lot of its strategic elements and has become less of a dialogue and more of two unilateral <laughs> side <laughs> statements. And so if it's going to survive in its current form or some new form, it's got to become more strategic and more mm. dialogue. Mm. Mr. Yuan, final I think uh, now is the eighth, but um, not necessarily means the last. Even if uh, it's the last one under Obama administration, but we do hope this SNG can last long because uh, we the past the seventh to eighth round of the dialogue, which achieve a lot. All right. Mm. They always say the last but not the least. We're going to say the eighth but not the least and not the last. <laughs> we hope that will be the case. Thank you so much for both of you, very articulatingly helping us to understand the current state of the bilateral relations. Yuan Peng, Scott Kennedy, thank you for being with us. Sure. Thank you. Stay with us here on World Insight. We've got our final segment coming right up. At the just concluded Shangri-La Dialogue in Singapore, China hit back against the criticism on the South China Sea. What's really at stake? Welcome back. You're watching World Insight on CCTV News. This year's Shangri-La Dialogue, Asia's largest annual security forum wrap-up in Singapore last Sunday. Territorial disputes in the South China Sea dominated the three-day meeting. U.S. Defense Secretary Ash Carter and Chinese Admiral Sun Jianguo both delivered speeches on the issue. And both used the keyword challenge in the title of their addresses. Before going to our discussion, first, let's take a look at this backgrounder. Numerous speeches, discussions, and meetings. The three-day Shangri-La dialogue was dominated by the South China Sea issue. In his speech on Saturday, U.S. Defense Secretary Ash Carter urged China to join a principled security network for Asia, saying that the United States would remain the most powerful military and the main guarantor of regional security for decades to come. China's actions in the South China Sea are isolating it at a time when the entire region is coming together and networking. Unfortunately, if these actions continue, China could end up erecting a great wall of self-isolation. On the last day of the Shangri-La Dialogue, Chinese Admiral Sun Jianguo took center stage to reassert China's military role and security policy. The Chinese military, while resolutely defending sovereignty, security, and development interests of the nation, has committed to properly handle the differences, jointly controlling risks, and peacefully settling disputes with countries concerned. Admiral Sun also emphasized that China doesn't stir up trouble, but is not afraid of trouble. During the Q&A session, he even asked for more time to answer questions regarding the South China Sea. You only give me one minute. I can answer more questions as long as you give me time. China has faced criticism over the South China Sea, but some nations have spoken out in the country's defense. I really appreciate China's contribution in maintaining world peace and stability. Thailand is also trying hard to organize its forces to engage in peacekeeping. China's peacekeeping image has set a good example for other countries. As an independent forum, the Shangri-La Dialogue served to provide a platform for different voices on a very contentious issue. For more discussion on the just-concluded Shangri-La Dialogue, we are joined here in the Beijing studio by Mr. Zhang Junshe, who is a senior captain from the China Naval Research Institute. He was there yes. at the Shangri-La Dialogue, just came back this afternoon into Beijing. Welcome, sir. Thank Meanwhile, you. we would also like to welcome from Washington, D.C., Mr. Christopher Young, Donald Brand, Chair of Non-Western Strategic Thought at the Marine Corps University. Welcome as well. In Singapore, we are welcoming Dr. A. Sun Ho, who is a senior fellow from the Institute of Defense and Strategic Studies at St. Ramarathan School of International Studies in Nanyang Technological University. I hope I pronounced your school's name right, sir, but it's quite a complicated one. Let me ask you That's right. <laughs> a complicated question to begin yeah, with, right. Mr. Zhang here in Beijing. Is China, as Secretary Carter indicated, trying to build 
a great wall on the South China Sea? Absolutely not. Uh, I don't think uh, Mr. Carter's characterization, uh, ca characterization of China's uh, activities in the South China Sea as uh, building a great wall of isolation, self-isolation. Isolation. I think this is not true. We think that this is a word, a termi terminology, invented by Mr. Carter or fabricated by China. Because uh, in recent years, we have said uh, clear that China has tried to be more open, more transparent, and also China has joined in the activities of um, other with other countries in this uh, region, including the ten plus eight. 10 plus 1 with ASEAN countries. Mm. And in the future, China will take more and more activities, security activities and security cooperation with the countries around this mm. region. Okay, well, the Chinese side have already stated his opinion. Let's go to our American guest. Uh, we have been hearing uh, Secretary Carter during the Shangri-La dialogue talking about uh, some specific remarks regarding China's uh, position now in the South China Sea. He talked about con constant, uh, when he was asked about constant uh, reconnaissance near China's territorial water, uh, Secretary Carter, uh, talk about this. We want to listen in and let's try to understand what exactly he meant. Let's listen in. Forward-thinking statesmen and leaders must once again come together to ensure a positive and principled future. Through a principled security network, we can all meet the challenges we're facing together. And the United States is fully committed to this principled security network and to the Asia Pacific's principled future. We just love those abstract terminologies. <laughs> now the turn is yours, uh, <laughs> Mr. Young. Uh, what exactly is the principle of the future and the principle of the, the security network? Uh, does that include everyone or does that exclude some specific members that are crucial? Okay, so a principled security network is largely the idea that all countries uh, adhere to international law and seek to uh, resolve disputes peacefully through uh, either through international courts of justice or through uh, arbitration means. So that's the idea that, that, uh, that international law serves as the means through which you resolve the, the problem. So, the principle is that everyone can get involved. China is invited to uh, participate in a principal security network as long as it adheres to international law. Mm. The, the underlying theme is that China's reluctance to adhere to international law or to put its dispute before the International Court of Justice mm. might in the future um, exclude China from in getting involved. But that's the idea behind what the Secretary Carter is making the right. argument for. Uh, Mr. Yang, if I could just uh, let you help us to clarify one thing, because there are different clauses of so many different pieces of international law that all countries sure. could, uh, you know, grab one piece and say, why don't you follow this uh, in order to exclude the others from a network or any kinds of organization. So, uh, Will that be the strategy, you think, uh, from different sides? Uh, if that were the strategy, what would that mean for the peace and stability uh, in the region, Mr. Yang? Well, I mean, you're, you're correct in pointing out that, that you can interpret international law a number of different ways. Mm. I mean, China has signed on to UNCLOS, whereas the United States has not. Uh, China's interpretation of EEZs, for example, is that no country can operate its military within an EEZ of another country without getting permission from another country. The United States' position is that uh, EEZs represent international waters. So you're wow. correct in pointing out, you're correct in pointing out that uh, international law can be interpreted widely. But I think the large, I think largely most countries believe that that outside of a, a nation's territorial waters. Most countries believe that you can operate your, your militaries within another country's EEZ. China seems to have a different opinion on that. Okay. So, absolutely it, agree that there are differences of opinion on, uh, on interpretation. All right. It, it is absolutely an intellectual issue, even uh, very interesting to dig into, uh, even though we didn't have the time today to go through all of these the details. But let me come back to you, Mr. Zhang. You have heard, uh, together with our other panelists, uh, the discussion we had earlier about China's strategic and economic dialogue with the United States. Yes. So people there, which is the meeting that began today, yes. are talking about how can we make sure 
that the South China Sea issue is not going to drag the overall bilateral relations downward, but rather be an area in which the two sides can try to help to one another to constructively understand each other's strategic position and get used to it, and therefore adjust their own positions and plans for the region and also for the world. That's a very loaded question I have for you. But Mr. Zhang, this is extremely important. Well, I think, first I want to say that the South China Sea issue is not an issue between China and the United States, because the United States is not a claimant in this dispute. Second, uh, if it, it is a dispute uh, or issue between China right. and the United States. It's not the whole of the relationship between our two countries. We shouldn't focus too much on the South China Sea issue. Uh, now the excuse of the United States to meddle in this, in this issue is the so-called freedom of navigation. But actually, everyone can see that the freedom of navigation has never been a problem in this area. So the United States, talking, uh, when talking about the principle, what's right. the principle? The principle of international law, one of the is, uh, is the important is the respect of the but, 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 sovereignty but, 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 of other let countries. Me, let me just put it this way. We could argue about all of these very important principles for another two <laughs> or even three or three, four <laughs> hours and days. But the thing is, I, let me ask you strategically, yes. Mr. Zhang, that is how from China's military side that we are going to make sure under the current circumstances is not going to drag the whole relationship particularly the military military relationship. It's being even said by the Chinese President Xi Jinping, he said this yeah. is one area military military exchanges can be enhanced. So how is that going not going to drag the whole thing down uh, even have, further? Yes. Uh, I have to say that now the ball is in the US side. It is the okay. United States military which has launched so many military actions in the South China Sea, uh, including the provocations against China's sovereignty. It's the United States. Who is militarizing okay. this region? Not the Chinese military. All right, we heard your opinion. Let me go to you, Dr. O. Oh, thank you for being very patient and waiting for the other two gentlemen to reach a conclusion. No conclusion can be reached this time, it seems. But, uh, but it's very important that we have a voice also from Southeast Asia. Uh, Dr. O, oh, from the just concluded Shangri-La dialogue. What conclusion can you draw as coming from one of those countries? Uh, and what strategic goals do you think this dialogue eventually achieved or did not achieve? Well, the Shangri-La dialogue, uh, by definition, is a dialogue. So it provides a forum for various uh, interested parties particularly well over the past few years in the South China Sea to come to a forum to try to mm. at least voice out their opinions uh, publicly as opposed to uh, for example either duking it out in the open sea or discussing it behind closed doors and for countries in Southeast Asia and so on if two superpowers are talking behind closed doors then we get a little bit nervous so it is indeed good to have such a forum whereby uh, they can voice out the different opinions yeah. Mm. Yes, indeed. Uh, but does it provide much inspiration for you, given uh, the media reportage of uh, this dialogue, given the different kinds of direct quotes coming from various delegations, the Chinese one, the American one, and some of the Southeast Asian countries as well? Well, the, obviously over the past few years, uh, the Shangri-La Dialogue has been, as you said, dominated uh, by the South China Sea issue, but it's not, at least for this year, overwhelmed by the South China Sea mm. issue. There are various other issues such as, for example, uh, the, the issue about terrorism or counter-terrorism, which actually sees a lot of uh, common views even among, for example, countries such as the United States and uh, China. Well, in, uh, as, as regards to South China Seas, I am actually a little bit uh, underwhelmed this year because uh, Secretary Carter did not, uh, for example, as uh, in the previous year, uh, spell out uh, in details uh, what in the U.S. views uh, mm. or, uh, China's uh, egregious actions in South China Seas. He simply sort of glossed over saying a series of disturbing actions.
China and South China Seas. So I see that as an improvement that, uh, for example, the invitation to China to be included in this so-called principled uh, security network, I see that as an inclusion here. Yeah. Mm. Well, of course, he didn't specifically figure, uh, uh, explain as to China is being invited or uh, whether all kind, all sides should work together towards something like that. Not really someone inviting other countries to join because it's not really belonging to anyone originally. But uh, let me ask you, uh, Mr. Zhang, what Mr. O oh said is extremely important. How to make sure all of the other extremely important issues are also being handled, not only during the Shangri-La dialogue, but also during the day-to-day, mill-to-mill exchanges among all countries. That is extremely important. For example, about the DPRK issue, about anti-terrorism. This is a, there's a long list. Can we not, once again, come to you? Let one issue be the obstacle for us to see all the significances of the other issues. No, uh, actually we are cooperating with the United States and other countries on uh, many security issues, including the issues on the Korean Peninsula and also the, war, uh, the, the struggle or the fight against terrorism and also piracy. Actually, the Chinese Navy has been co uh, coordinating and cooperating with the U.S. Navy in the Gulf of Aden and waters of Somalia on the fight uh, against piracy, and we cooperated very well. And also, I, I believe that uh, the South China Sea issue is not the only issue that uh, confronts all of us in this region. Uh, just as we mentioned, uh, terrorism, piracy, and natural disasters, and all these we should uh, mm. well, we should uh, deal with or uh, deal with together. Okay. Uh, and also at the Shangri-La Dialogue, many countries also express hope that they can, uh, including Vietnam, the, vi the Deputy Minister of National Defense of Vietnam also express hope that it will cooperate with China and other countries in maintaining peace and stability mm -hmm. in this region. I think this is the uh, majority's voice on this. We shouldn't uh, focus our attention on the South China Sea issue. Not on, the, not on that only. only. I think that is extremely important. Having said that though, uh, Mr. Yang, uh, one thing, one of the reasons why people look at these two issues, both the South China Sea and also the Korean Peninsula issue that closely, is the suspicion whether these two issues are likely to drive the countries in the regions and beyond to establish certain kinds of mechanisms or networks did not exist before and yet could exist now in the name of these issues and yet for the long term could be very harmful strategically for other countries in the regions. If I could just put it bluntly, Mr. Yang, I'm talking about the United States, suspicion coming from China uh, for the South uh, Korea to establish a THAAD missile system, which of course is not just about the DPRK, and also in the South China Sea to establish a network against China in the region with other Southeast Asian countries. So Mr. Yang, your comments on that. So your question is whether or not uh efforts to resolve this issue would, uh, would lead to the United States developing security networks against China. So a uh, bottom line is you're asking whether or not the United States is leading an effort to contain or constrain China's, uh, China's capability. I presume that's the question you're asking. I think that could be the question, even though there are different understanding about that strategy also inside your country, even within Washington, D.C. itself. Okay, so, I mean, to answer those questions uh, one at a time, the first is the United States is not leading an effort to, to contain China. So you, don't, you do not see Secretary Carter walking around saying, we need to form another NATO. He's mm. not saying that. What he is saying is, we're trying to form a principal security network to which China is invited uh, if it so chooses. He is not attempting to create another NATO. Secondly, we do know that from the history of the region, the, 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 the likelihood of another NATO is very unlikely and mm. you don't even see ASEAN developing uh, a defense alliance of that kind mm -hmm. so with regard to with regard to the Korean Peninsula I, I know that my Chinese friends have a suspicion that that the efforts to put 
theater missile defense on the Korean Peninsula uh, ha is directed at China, again, that is not the case. If you talk to your South Korean friends, they'll say that's specifically related to the threat that North Korea poses to South Korea. And so the United States right. working with its ally, South Korea, uh, that's a specifically focused on a South Korean security requirement. All right. I, I know there's a temptation with, within China to, to, to expand it regionally and to think that it has a wider regional implication. But again, uh, that isn't, that's not what the United States intent is, and that's not what the South Korean intent is. Well, words are important. Of course, they also have to be back up with, with actions. Yeah. Uh, but Mr. Zhang, let me ask you also a very equally important question. How would the United States make sure that China, with your ever-expanding economy, ever stronger military, is not trying to exclude the United States out of the Asia-Pacific region? Probably that's your aspiration. They would have the suspicion like that. Well, I, I don't think we have never had an idea to expel the United States out of this, uh, this region. Uh, we have said many times that the Pacific Ocean is uh, large enough uh, to accommodate the, these two countries. Mm -hmm. And uh, actually, the United States is, uh, is clear about this. All right. But from outside, we have uh, seen that its new strategy of rebalancing in this region is aimed at containing China's rights. Well, we have suspicions. That's why we need dialogues, and that's why we need discussions like this. Thank you so much, gentlemen, the three of you coming from different perspectives for shedding some light from your own stance. Uh, Zhang Junshe, Christopher Young, and also A. Sun Oh. Really appreciate you, gentlemen, for being with us. That is all the time we have for today. Thank you. If you'd like to see more of our program, visit our website. Just type in World Insight CCTV News into your search engine. You'll be able to find us, or you can also check out our YouTube channel. From me, Tian Wei, and everyone at the World Insight team, thanks for watching. And tune in again tomorrow for more insights from across China and around the world. Good night.